Richard Bogan on behalf of CME Outfitters, I would like to welcome and thank you for joining us for episode four of this four-part CMEO snack series detailing highlights from the SLEEP 2021 meeting. Today's episode is titled Putting Idiopathic Hypersomnia Treatment Challenges to Rest, the latest evidence on the safety and efficacy of emerging therapies. This CMEO snack series is supported by an educational grant from Jazz Pharmaceuticals Incorporated and is brought to you by CME Outfitters, an award-winning accredited provider of continuing education for clinicians worldwide. Again, I am Richard Bogan, president of Bogan Sleep Consultants, LLC. I am also an associate clinical professor at the University of South Carolina School of Medicine in Columbia, South Carolina, and associate clinical professor at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, South Carolina. I am pleased to be joined today by Nancy Fulveri Schaefer, Professor of Neurology at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine of Case Western University, as well as Director of Cleveland Clinic Sleep Disorder Center in Cleveland, Ohio. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you. It's great to be with you today. Well, let's uh, frame today's episode. Let's start by reviewing our learning objectives, which is to evaluate novel strategies for the management of idiopathic hypersomnia with and without long sleep time. We'll talk about that some more. For their benefit in improving excessive daytime sleepiness, symptom severity, and global functioning. At CME Outfitters, we always like to provide the most up-to-date practice strategies to our audience. With that in mind, hot off the press is the FDA approval of lower sodium oxalate for idiopathic hypersomnia in adults, which occurred on August 12, 2021. Prior to lower sodium oxalate, there were no FDA approved agents. And at the time of this poster abstract, it had not yet been approved. How was treatment typically approached? This is a very interesting question, uh, again, because we now have an FDA-approved drug for the first time. So generally, patients with idiopathic hypersomnia are treated similar uh, to the way we treat pa patients with narcolepsy. But in many cases, we have restrictions. Uh, because these agents haven't been FDA-approved specifically for idiopathic hypersomnia, we often aren't able to provide access to all of these medications for our patient population. Exactly. Among the important highlights from the SLEEP 2021 meeting were new data on lower sodium oxalate for the management of idiopathic hypersomnia. These data obviously contributed to the approval of lower sodium oxalate. Today, we are going to discuss two posters on idiopathic hypersomnia with a similar study design. One po poster reports data from a two-week safety follow-up period. Let's begin with a discussion of the former, the poster titled, Efficacy and Safety of Lower Sodium Oxalate in Adults with Idiopathic Hypersomnia with and without long sleep time. Nancy, can you tell us about the study? Yeah, so this study design uh, for both posters was the same. It was the same trial. And patients with idiopathic hypersomnia who were either treatment naive or could have been on any other kind of alerting agent, including sodium oxalate, uh, were enrolled in this placebo-controlled uh, randomized double-blind withdrawal study. Uh, so essentially, patients uh, with IH were enrolled, underwent an open-label titration period, then a two-week stable dose period, followed by this double-blind randomized withdrawal period, where patients were randomized to either continue lower sodium oxalate or randomized to placebo for two weeks after which they entered open label extension. And so the results we'll talk about today compare the status of patients at the end of that stable dose period to the end of the double blind randomized withdrawal phase. Yeah, important points here. I mean, obviously maintenance of effect trial where it's a very humane study because patients come in, they're very sleepy. They don't want to stop any stimulants or wakeless promoting medication. So this is a nice way to get them on a stable dose and then randomize them to the placebo group. So what were the key findings? How do we assess efficacy in these individuals 
with lower sodium oxybate in patients with idiopathic hypersomnia. So I know we, um, the Epworth score was one of them. Can you comment on that? Yes, yeah, so the Epworth sleepiness scale score was the primary endpoint. Uh, and regardless of whether patients had long sleep time or short sleep or shorter sleep time, not, not without long sleep time, uh, there was similar responsiveness in terms of the Epworth sleepiness scale. So patients who uh, were randomized to placebo during the double-blind randomized uh, withdrawal phase had worsening symptoms of sleepiness, meaning an elevation of the Epworth sleepiness score relative to patients who continued on uh, lower sodium oxybate. And again, without differences between the long sleep time and without long sleep time groups. Yeah, these are different phenotypes, and we'll talk about that some more. Uh, what about the idiopathic hypersomnia scale? So the idiopathic hypersomnia severity scale is a scale that is uh, specific to patients with idiopathic hypersomnia. Uh, this is a 14-item scale that many of us don't yet use in our practices, uh, but is an important addition to this clinical trial. Uh, and it assesses nighttime symptoms, daytime symptoms, both with sleep inertia, as well as the consequences during the day of having idiopathic hypersomnia. And like the upward sleepiness scale, changes in the idiopathic hypersomnia severity scale occurred in patients randomized to placebo and not in patients uh, who continued on lower sodium oxybate. So symptoms of idiopathic hypersomnia worsened during the double-blind placebo-controlled phase in placebo patients, but not in patients who continued lower sodium oxybate. Yeah, I think that's an important point we have. This is a very specific tool for this subgroup of individuals. And so it gives us not only the degree of sleepiness, but as you said, the sleep inertia and the quality of life has different domains that we can look at, a validated tool. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll all become more familiar with it. Um, so we have measures of the Epworth and the IHSS, but patients report to us as well as we ask patients how they're doing. So could you give us some information on the patient global impression of change scale? Yes. And so again, uh, for the groups that had long sleep time as well as without long sleep time, from the end of the stable dose period to the end of the double blind randomized control period, more participants who were randomized to placebo reported worsening in their idiopath idiopathic hypersomnia symptoms. That might have been mild worsening, uh, a lot of worsening, or very much worsening compared to the lower sodium oxybate group. So this shows us that patients also uh, perceived uh, stable improvement uh, on uh, lower sodium oxybate relative to patients randomized to placebo. Yeah. It's very, very important. I think the FDA obviously has a lot of interest in this patient global impression as well as clinical global impression. The patients are actually telling us blinded how they're feeling compared to the placebo group and the ones on lower sodium oxybate. So clearly, lower sodium oxybate is efficacious in reducing the symptoms associated with the idiopathic hypersomnia. But what do we know about the safety from the trial? Well, very similar to the lower sodium oxybate data in narcolepsy, uh, the majority of patients in this group did report a, a treatment emergent adverse event, but the vast majority of these were mild to moderate and short-lived. The most common symptoms in this cohort of patients were nausea, headache, dizziness, anxiety, and vomiting. And again, most of them were transient and did not lead to discontinuation of study drug. Yeah, I always, uh, I always tell my patients, you know, headache, dizzy, nausea, and um, so it, it does make you sleepy. You take it at night, which is kind of interesting when you think about the disorder, and these individuals are sleepy. They take this at night, and they more easily awaken in the day and have improvement in symptoms, as, as you see. Now, the other poster from Sleep 2021 uh, this looked at different dosing regimens from lower sodium oxybate and idiopathic hypersomnia. One of the challenges, obviously, these individuals, once they go to sleep, it's hard for them to awaken to take that second dose. The poster was titled, Efficacy and Safety of Once and Twice Nightly Dosing of Lower Sodium Oxybate in Adults with Idiopathic Hypersomnia. Again, the study design was similar to the previous poster 
that we discuss, but this poster included a safety follow-up period. What differences were observed between patients receiving once nightly versus twice nightly dosing? Yes, yeah, so of this cohort in this randomized controlled trial, 26% of uh, participants were treated with once nightly dosing. And this was a decision made by the clinician who n knows the patient. Uh, and so very similar to the data we just discussed, patients with once nightly dosing had a similar response uh, in their upward sleepiness scores when randomized to placebo uh, versus those who continued lower sodium oxybate therapy. Uh, in other words, whether a patient was taking once nightly or twice nightly, those who were randomized to placebo had a worsening in their daytime sleepiness, and those who continued sodium, lower sodium oxybate uh, had a stable uh, degree of daytime sleepiness based on the upward sleepiness scale. So there clearly is a signal there of less sleepiness um, in these individuals. And of course, as clinicians, we dose to effect as we follow our patients. What about the idiopathic hypersomnia scale? The same findings really are there for the idiopathic hypersomnia scale, which is really great news for patients with idiopathic hypersomnia who, again, have trouble waking up during the night to take a second dose. So patients with once nightly dosing had the same sustained improvement in their idiopathic hypersomnia severity scores once whether when they were randomized to lower sodium oxybate and those randomized to placebo had a worsening of those scores. Excellent. And again, from the patient perspective, the PGIC in terms of efficacy of lower sodium oxybate, uh, would you comment on that? Yeah. And again, the story is the same. So whether uh, we're administering in once nightly or twice nightly. There does not seem to be, there did not seem to be a difference between the two in this group. Uh, and from the end of the stable dose period to the end of the double blind randomized withdrawal period, more participants who were randomized to placebo reported worsening of their symptoms than those who remained on lower sodium oxybate. Again, no difference between the once nightly and twice nightly administration. Okay, very, very good. Um, so what about uh, treatment emergent adverse events that significantly differed across the dosing regimens? So less patients had a, trans, a treatment emergent adverse event uh, when prescribed the once nightly dose, but not significantly different than the twice nightly dose. And the pattern of adverse events is really the same. Uh, nausea, headache, dizziness, anxiety, vomiting and decreased appetite uh, were the most common treatment emergent adverse events, regardless of dose regimen. Yes, uh, Nancy, uh, thank you for this great discussion of these two pivotal studies on the safety and efficacy of lower sodium oxybate in IH and now approved um, for the treatment of idiopathic hypersomnia. We've had a chance to look at its efficacy, not only in those with and without long sleep times as those two phenotypes, but also in different dosing regimens. It is always nice to share how the latest clinical studies translate into an FDA approval. Would you like to make some concluding remarks? Well, I think it's such an exciting time uh, for those of us who treat patients with CNS hypersomnia, as well as our patients who, um, despite current therapies growing, continue to be burdened with uh, excessive daytime sleepiness and other disabling symptoms. Uh, so it's very exciting to have lower sodium oxybate as the first uh, and only uh, FDA approved treatment for idiopathic hypersomnia and very reassuring to know that uh, efficacy is comparable between long sleep time and those without long sleep time as well as once nightly regimen uh, with a two nightly regimen. Uh, this is very important information for us to use to counsel patients, and the side effect profile is very much the same as we know from uh, sodium oxybate therapy. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, the signal is there, both in terms of the Epworth and the idiopathic hypersomnia severity scale, So, um, and the PGICs. Let's wrap it up with our SMART goals, that is, actions that we hope you can use in your practice, and they are incorporate lower sodium oxybate into treatment planning for IH, not only to improve symptoms, but also global functioning. 
And when making treatment decisions for patients with IH, with and without long sleep time, consider the latest clinical evidence on the safety and efficacy of lower sodium oxidate. This has been the fourth and final episode of this four-part CMEO snack series detailing key highlights from the SLEEP 2021 meeting. We hope that you will take advantage of the additional short focused activities in this series. We will discuss additional highlights on the use of lower sodium oxalate in the management of idiopathic hypersomnia, as well as key findings on dosing and titration strategies when managing narcolepsy, and the significance of cardiovascular comorbidities associated with narcolepsy. Nancy, again, I'd like to thank you for sharing this latest evidence on the safety and efficacy of lower sodium oxalate in idiopathic hypersomnia, but also I would really like to thank you for the enormous contributions that you have made to the field of sleep medicine. Both our colleagues and certainly your patients appreciate all that you do. Oh, thank you very much. It was my pleasure being with you today. It's a great study and great posters. So, um, and of course, I would like to thank you, our audience, for participating and for providing the best care for patients. Take good care. <laughs>